Okay, is everyone seeing my screen? Yeah, Jerry, we can see it. you're showing the um, you're showing the secondary screen. If you have a secondary one, you can change if you share the presenter mode, change it to your primary screen to where you can just see your um, the main the main screen rather than the the uh, next screen. There you go. Right. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to present this evening. Um, I know that we're all in kind of uh, awkward mode here, um, being able to do this uh, via go-to meeting, but I appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Jerry Schramm. I'm the Director of Operations at Lancaster EMS. I've been in EMS since 1997, started as an EMT in 97 in the Philadelphia area, became my paramedic in 1999, worked for the fire department in Philadelphia from 2000 to 2006. I had the busiest medic unit in the country, I ran over 10,000 calls at that unit. I would not be uncommon to run anywhere between 25 to 30 calls in a shift. Um, so I got a lot of experience before I relocated out here to Lancaster EMS. I uh, started as a staff paramedic, promoted up to a field supervisor uh, before becoming the director of operation. Um, so I've been able to see EMS from a lot of different uh, different um, viewpoints, viewpoints from this, the, um, just the, uh, the uh, transport A company, um, doing uh, the interfacility transports to the 911 only, and then to, uh, to a balance as I came out to Lancaster between the transports and the 911 system. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, from just uh, general experience over the years. I've also got my bachelor's in healthcare administration, so I got to, to kind of learn the theory behind everything. So hopefully everything that I've been able to, uh, to accumulate over time through formal education and just boots on the ground, um, I'm able to go ahead and translate that into something that you guys find useful. So uh, as we go through this, uh, this PowerPoint, um, it should cover everything that, uh, that you need to know for your, uh, for your program. So some of the, um, the different things we're going to cover uh, applies the uh, the knowledge, the operation roles, responsibilities, ensure patient, public, and per personal safety, uh, ambulance standards. So ambulance standards oversight for EMS uh, usually falls to state governments, um, requirements for ambulance service written in state statutes or regulations, national standards and trends have influence on the development of laws. Um, so in PA, we use uh, Act 37, it's the EMS Act. Uh, it governs what we can and can't do on an ambulance, how EM ambulances are designed, uh, and make sure that we have uh, ambulances that are both safe and functional, that we have all the equipment necessary for the ambulance, and make sure that all of our providers are credentialed, that they have the appropriate credentials to be able to drive their vehicles. Uh, and this goes even further into national standards. Uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, they've been kind of restrictive in adopting those national standards, but they're starting to become more flexible. Uh, as everybody knows, you'll take the National Registry test at the end of your program. Uh, it used to be when Rick and I became paramedics, we just took the, uh, the state test. Um, so it's a lot different as PA started to adapt those national standards. Um, and then those national standards are adapted on the, uh, on the operations side as well uh, when it comes to different ambulance designs and processes. Um, but the state laws are, are broad in some senses. Other, uh, you go from state to state, you'll realize that some laws are a little tighter than others. Um, regulations provide more specific guidelines or rules. Uh, as they, the state laws come out and they talk about the Motor Vehicle Code, uh, the State Department of Health um, and their regulatory bodies, the Bureau of EMS, can further um, refine this into what they say you can and you can't do uh, as far as uh, regulations, what you need on an ambulance, what you need for equipment, what you need for lighting, 
um, how you how you label your ambulance. So things can change um, just from the state laws all the way down to uh, the specific regulations. Uh, as it says, the state standards tend to be generic, um, uh, politically feasible to all EMS agencies throughout the state. Uh, they tend to, uh, from from a Bureau of EMS standpoint, they tend to make sure that. Uh, an agency that's uh, that's well up in uh, in the northern part of Pennsylvania, maybe in a rural area, uh, has the same standards as say a Philadelphia ambulance in a, a high volume area of the city. So the standards are all set so that everyone can meet them. Um, if the standards were set extraordinarily high, it might be tough for those one horse institutions, uh, the one one ambulance that might be volunteer based only, uh, to compete with somebody who's much, much larger, like a municipal department, like a Pittsburgh or a Philadelphia, or somebody who has a high volume uh, with a lot of municipal funding. So they try to make those um, feasible so that all agencies can adapt. Uh, as I said, it sets the minimal standards rather than the gold standard for operations, because not all agencies have the funding and the availability to meet those high standards. It's not to say they don't want to meet those standards, but we have to realize that there's uh, a, a lot of constraints there to keep everyone from meeting that high level of standard. Uh, local regional EMS systems are more detailed and approach that gold standard. So depending on where you're at, uh, at in, your, uh, in your region, some regions are very progressive. Um, they, they drive uh, tighter regulations, they have uh, uh, more resources, and they tend to be a little bit more dynamic than some other regions would be. So for ambulance designs, uh, you can see the U.S. General Services Administration's Automotive Commodity, Commodity Center issues federal regulations. They specify ambulance design manufacturing. Uh, the specifications, the DOT KKK 1822F specs influence ambulance standards as well as standardize the look of the ambulance. So the important part to talk about here is that um, we do have, they have to continue to, to evaluate ambulances and make sure that the ambulances um, meet those particular designs that are necessary. So we need to make sure that our ambulances are safe. We need to make sure that they're manufactured correctly. There are so many different manufacturers across the country who design and build ambulances. If there were no standards, then you would certainly have some issue. Uh, when an ambulance comes rolling down the roadway and you don't know that you're going to be in the back and, and crumpled at the, at the first um, fender bender. Um, so we want to make sure that all the ambulances at least meet that basic standard. Um, and then the, uh, the case specs are adapted, uh, adopted by um, Pennsylvania, but not all, um, not all will, will go ahead and use those same standards. So it's going to be, it's going to be different um, from state to state. So, we do have some states that are going to use the, uh, the case specs. <clears throat> some states are going to use the case specs, uh, but there are, there's other states that are going to use uh, the NFPA. Uh, there's other states that are going to use CAS. So the NFPA 1917 also has uh, standards on ambulance safety and CAS, the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services, has a separate set of standards uh, called the GBS uh, V1.0. Uh, they're all based on the, uh, the standard of automotive excellence, the SAE standards. So they make sure that the ambulances meet a specific standard. Each one differs just slightly. Um, one may say that the seat has to be um, 27 inches off the ground. Somebody else might say that it needs to be 34 inches off the ground. Um, so they differ uh, just, just slightly, but for the most part, each one is going to go ahead and cover uh, each of these dynamic criteria to make sure that the ambulance is going to be safe. They just differ on um, some of the details uh, as far as what their standards say. So again, PA does go ahead and adapt the uh, the case standards along with um, with 19 other states. Six states have no ambulance design regulations and the remaining may or may not use the case specs. So um, while there is a lot of the, uh, the, the specifications out there for ambulance design, so the builders have something to adhere to, um, just know that there are states that don't have any regulations. So you could just buy uh, a truck and throw a box on the back of it, call in an ambulance in some of these states, and uh, and it would be appropriate. So there's just no no requirements or regulations for them. So it's important as you're specking out an ambulance, as you're looking to buy an ambulance, to, to really evaluate the manufacturer, 
Um, know that they're, um, ask what, what specifications they're using. Are they using the case specs when they're, uh, when they're specking an ambulance? Know that the Department of Health in their, uh, the Department of Health in their licensure requirements, in their standards, they do require that all ambulances meet the minimum federal specs um, for KKK 1822. Uh, so you will need to make sure that any ambulance that you buy in the state of Pennsylvania in order to be licensed must meet the K specs. So as I said, they're going to differ just somewhat between the NFPA and between CAS, um, but it's the K specs that Pennsylvania is going to adhere to as far as licensing your vehicle. Um, so just be careful that when you are specking out an ambulance going through it as a builder, make sure that they're using the case specs and not NFPA and not CAS um, because they may differ slightly. So different style of ambulances. So a type one conventional truck cab chassis with modular ambulance body, the pickup truck front end with the box on the back. The type two is a standard van, um, called in our social circles, called the van, van Beelins. Um, so that's just the standard van um, front with the, uh, with the back um, outfitted uh, for, for an ambulance design. And then the type three is a van front end with the box on the back. So here's a type one ambulance. Again, the pickup truck front end with the box on the back. Um, these vehicles tend to be a mechanic's dream. They love to work on them. They're easy to access. Uh, you're easy, to, easy to, to replace parts and work on them. They're a pickup truck for all intent and purposes. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the ability for them to be able to, to monkey with things and take this off and replace this is a lot easier than working on a type two or a type three. Uh, another thing is that these tend to be more expensive. Um, in order to, uh, one of the biggest components that most have gone with with the type ones has been the liquid springs in the rear. So the liquid springs makes it a more comfortable ride and adjusts for that bounce that we, uh, we old timers like Rick and I, when these things were first rolled out on the street, we would bounce our way down the highway and have a, a ball trying to start an IV. Um, but now these liquid springs make it so that adjustment kind of compensates pretty quickly. Um, but it comes at a high cost. These vehicles could easily cost you well over $200,000 um, and even more depending on the, uh, the bells and whistles that you add to it. Here's a Vanbulance. This is an older model, model Vanbulance. Um, most of the, uh, the, the, the services now, if you're purchasing a new Vanbulance, you're likely going with um, a Transit. So Ford shifted away from the E250s and they've gone towards the Transits. Um, so we do have a couple of Transits at Lancaster EMS. I know a couple other services do as well. I think they're, uh, they're certainly serviceable. Uh, they seem to have a decent amount of space to be able to function in the back um, and not a bad vehicle overall. Uh, this here is the traditional uh, Type 3 ambulance. Uh, that's what you see in most often nowadays. It uh, has the van front end with the box on the rear. So it is a little more complicated for our mechanics. They tend to, uh, to take a little longer on replacing, especially some heavy duty engine work. Uh, you have to access through the dog box and a lot of times, which is uh, just an access point on the inside of the, uh, the cab where they have to access certain parts of the motor. Um, so repairs could be a little bit more complicated than they are on the Type 1, perhaps take a little bit longer. Um, you tend to get uh, some good mileage out of these vehicles. The bounce and move in the back is not nearly what it is on a Type 1 uh, ambulance, and they typically come in at about $40,000 cheaper than a Type 1. So uh, while it's not necessarily considered in most cases, type one, type two, and type three are the, uh, the three types of ambulances, there are medium duty rescue vehicles that in some uh, areas may be utilized in an ambulance function. Uh, they're designed to have, handle the heavier loads. Uh, you might see this where an EMS service is putting uh, paramedics on, uh, on a fire truck of some sort and they're operating rescues. They may have something this size. Uh, it's about 24,000 pounds, most of our, um, our type uh, three ambulances are someplace in the ballpark of 10 to 12,000 pounds. Uh, the type ones may be a little more than that. Um, but these are the big heavy duty uh, vehicles. Um, so, so again, sometimes a fourth type of ambulance uh, provide guidelines for states to follow and the federal specs is a basis for their own regulations. Um, so everyone's using the federal specs to kind of guide their ambulance designs. So some of the recent pushes over the last uh, last decade to improve safety, 
Um, there's been a lot of just different um, different agencies that have been starting to explore uh, what what is the safety standard. Um, CAS, NFPA, uh, the case specs, they're all evaluating, they're, um, they're monitoring all the crash test safety. They're constantly looking to update um, their, their regulations and their specs. And obviously the Department of Transportation is looking at the same. Um, some concept ambulances, uh, an exterior view, you see this is kind of space age, Mercedes front on that one. Um, Mercedes obviously known as a, a safe vehicle. Uh, here's, here's the back of, um, uh, of one of these different ambulances. You can see how the design is in the back. Uh, they go with the cargo netting to prevent anybody from sliding forward there. Um, you have the, uh, the seat belts. You can see the seat belt design. Obviously, you want to make sure that somebody has that four-point harness design uh, so you stay safe in your seat. Uh, this here is a different design. Uh, the slider seat is a popular um, uh, safety update that, uh, that you see in a lot of ambulances now. Um, the new specs uh, have, have kind of shifted in that direction. Uh, you want to make sure that you can forward face. Rear facing seats are certainly not what our um, sideways facing seats are not what they're, they're looking to have in ambulances now. They're looking to have something that's going to be a forward facing um, because that's the way it, you're, if you're going to get hit, you're, you're going to jostle from from side to side, they want to make sure you're forward facing and seat belted in nice and secure. So most of these are slider seats. They're able to slide back and forth. You're able to sit uh, restrained in your vehicle for the duration of. Uh, you're not going to have to get out of your seat. Everything's within finger touch. Um, and you're going to be able to uh, still have access to the patient. And when you're not um, physically intervening with the patient, you can spin your seat around and be able to be forward facing. You'll also know, notice that right here in the center, uh, is a center mount, uh, it's a striker center mount for the uh, for the litters. That's also a requirement in all newly built ambulances. The old horn design system uh, has gone by the wayside. Uh, they found that these are much more secure, especially uh, if that ambulance was going to be struck on the side, if that ambulance was going to tip. Um, the the uh, the center mount is going to lock that stretcher in. There's some pins in the center of the stretcher that will catch in that center mount, and prevent that stretcher from, uh, from becoming dislodged in a vehicle accident. So you'll see some of these different safety standards. And here's what I was explaining with the slider seat. There's some drawers there, easily accessible. Uh, you see a shelf here to be able to put some of your things. Um, uh, you can certainly rotate this seat around uh, so that you have access to be able to, uh, to type on your, uh, do your paperwork or type on your tablet. Uh, so they put everything handy um, within hands reach. There's your sharps container, here's your monitor mount. So everything can be done from a seated position with your seat belts on, um, keeping you safe. So just some of the, the safety standards and the way that the, uh, the regulations are, are updating to try and keep EMS providers safe. So OSHA has helped a good bit with some of the equipment lists. Um, here is a, a publication through OSHA. Uh, it's very, um, very long, very lengthy document, uh, but it does go through everything from how to decon your ambulance uh, to the different equipment that you should have on your ambulance, um, how to keep yourself safe, a lot of the PPE that's needed. Um, so it's, uh, OSHA is, is certainly uh, instrumental in making sure that we have the, uh, the safety requirements we need to keep us so safe on the ambulance. So if you have an opportunity and you're able to go through and take a peek at this, uh, it certainly does outline everything that's going to be best practice. Standards re reference and local ordinance become standards for given municipalities, state, local, uh, medical direction board lists all the med medication paramedics can carry. Uh, specific advanced life support equipment supplied on every ambulance. Uh, so standards reference and local ordinance become standards for giving municipalities. Uh, so, so there's going to be some changes that, uh, especially in some of the larger municipalities where they're going to say, hey, we want to do it this way. There's going to be some tweaks and turns that you may have to do uh, as far as your response goes. Um, they may say, hey, we want to make sure that we have ambulances to be able to respond in X uh, amount of time. Uh, so they, they might go ahead and become the standard net municipality that they expect any ambulance to provide service there to respond within X amount of time. Uh, so some of those standards, they may ask about uh, certain equipment they want on the truck. We want to make sure that we have a MICU in our, 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 our area, um, a paramedic unit. Um, so they may go ahead and make that as their standard, what they want in their municipality, and that'll become the standard. 
Um, several state and local medical direction boards list the medications paramedics can carry. Uh, that comes through the, uh, the licensure requirement through the, uh, the state, the Bureau of EMS, at least in Pennsylvania. Uh, depends on once you go ex, ex outside of Pennsylvania, you go to some place like uh, Maryland or Texas where it's going to be a good bit different. They may have different protocols, uh, different lists of medications you can carry. So the state or, or local regional medical directors are going to go ahead and make those requirements of what you can and can't do, what you will and won't carry. Uh, even when we look internally in Pennsylvania, you look from agency to agency and some medical directors are a little bit more relaxed than others. Some may say, hey, I don't want you to do this, or hey, you are allowed to do that, uh, just because it falls underneath of the, um, of the, the state uh, allowance as far as protocol goes or as far as uh, licensure goes. It doesn't necessarily mean your medical director is going to allow it. Uh, for example, at Lancaster EMS, our medical director has a lot of reservation with uh, innovating pediatrics. The medical director requires that it be a med medical command contact before you innovate a pediatric, he'd much rather you uh, use uh, BLS measures to be able to uh, manage that airway. So um, that's not to say that other agencies aren't going to do uh, something different, but that's what Lancaster EMS's medical director requires of, of our paramedics. So, um, so different, different ones are going to have different requirements. Uh, those medications and that equipment might change. So the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services provides that gold standard uh, for the EMS community to follow. Uh, requires uh, medical equipment and supplies to comply with state and local guidelines. So the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services is a national accreditation. Uh, it requires that you meet that national criteria, which in many cases is above that of state and local guidelines. Um, but that does not mean that it, it, it exempts you from meeting those same state and local guidelines. You still will be responsible to uh, to make sure that your, your vehicle has all the requirements for the state and local. Uh, it doesn't mean that because you, uh, you, you accredit it by CAS that you can apply the CAS um, specs for your ambulance. You still need to meet the case specs for that ambulance because that's what the state of Pennsylvania requires. Um, so it doesn't mean that you can then not do what the state and the local guidelines require, but the CAS requirements just allow you to do a little bit more um, to meet that gold standard uh, when you compare yourself against agencies across the country. So checking the ambulance, it's a central part of your job. It includes um, duties, uh, completion, make sure your equipment, your supply checklist is done. Sorry, just some technical things on, on my end here. So it's part of the paramedics duties to include completion of ambulance equipment and supply check, ensure all equipment supplies are available, working order, ensures mechanical maintenance and availability of the personal protective equipment. So it's important that your ambulance always meets that, um, that particular uh, checklist. Make sure you always have the things that you need. Uh, make sure that at the beginning of your shift, you're checking to make sure that you have all of your monitor, make sure that your, uh, your licensure is up to par. Uh, make sure that you're ready to start your shift. You don't want to be that person that doesn't have that equipment that you need, or you start the ambulance and realize you don't have any gas, or that the uh, the ambulance doesn't start. So it's important that you always do a check of your ambulance right out of the gate uh, at the beginning of your shift. So let me um, let me go ahead and involve the class a little bit here. Um, what does everyone use at your own agency? Uh, is it a written checklist, electronic checklist, the honor system? Uh, what are you using at your agency to check out your ambulance to start a shift?
Yeah, electronic checklist. You say it's an electronic checklist. Is it up, uploaded in a platform? Is it um, is it something that's that's monitored? Um, how, how does it work? What is it? What does it check? Uh, as far as like the operational, your lights, uh, showing like perform, performance, making sure everything up and operating as it should electronically. That's documented. And that's response. That yes, your responsibility is complete right at the beginning of your shift. Yes. Yep. Jerry, it's Rick. Over on the chat side, I don't know if you have the chat room opened up, but uh, we have one student that says they use electronic. Uh, I have another individual that says they're still using a paper system. And then there's a third individual that's using an electronic form that's on their overall scheduling system. Okay. For the individual. Honor system with our supervisor. You, you said an honor system as well. Yeah, honor system for the supply portion of it, and then we have like the online portion for all the meds and whatnot. But it's mostly just on the honor system. Okay. Well, there's certainly different ways of being able to accomplish the same ends. Um, so uh, you always want to evaluate your process, make sure that it's working. Um, make sure that you don't have to tweak it a little bit. Make sure it encompasses everything. I know that uh, that, that we frequently at Lancaster EMS we're we're constantly tweaking something just a little bit more. Hey, can we add this to our checklist? Hey, can we take this away? We can we reconfigure this. Um, so it's always it's always good to go ahead and just take a look and just make sure that you're accomplishing what you set out to, uh, making sure that all of your equipment's accountable. Uh, checking the ambulance on uh, patient infection control. This is probably a really big one right now with uh, with COVID-19. Um, so uh, making sure you have your PPE, initial and focused assessment equipment, equipment for transfer of patient, equipment for airway maintenance, ventilation, resuscitation, oxygen therapy, and suction equipment. Um, so what would be the relevance if you uh, if you went ahead and you didn't check out your ambulance and you realized you were missing PPE when you arrived on scene? Well, uh, with COVID-19, that's going to be a pretty big, um, pretty big mix up there. So you certainly want to make sure that you check your ambulance, make sure you have the equipment that you need. Uh, this this is uh, can be a very complicated job when you don't have the equipment that you need. Um, there's a reason that everything's on that ambulance. So and you, you certainly don't want to reach for something and it not be there. Equipment for assisting with cardiac resuscitation, uh, supplies, equipment for mobilization of suspected bone injuries, um, supplies for wound care, treatment of shock, supplies for childbirth. Um, so uh, this is all stuff that you, you would typically go through and, and licensure, make sure that you have on your vehicle. I'm going to assume that's in most checklists as we go through, uh, whether that be electronic, whether that be paper, uh, you're certainly going to hit those hot topic items. Um, some of the more uh, the, the, the the more minute things, the things that you don't use very often, the infrequent equipment, maybe that hair traction splint, it certainly should be checked and make sure that you have it. Make sure you have those ankle straps. Um, so some of the equipment that doesn't use very often sometimes becomes an out of sight, out of mind uh, until you reach for it and realize that you're missing something that you need. So it's always good to go ahead and take a look. Um, make sure you have those things. Make sure that they're all functional and in good working order. Uh, make sure you have your ALS equipment, your medication supply, safety and miscellaneous equipment, information on operation and inspection of the ambulance itself. Uh, if you certainly don't know about the ambulance, you want to ask questions, you want to you learn. Um, if you've never been in that particular ambulance, you want to make sure that you know how the lights work, that the siren works, that the headlights work. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you can uh, you turn it on, check your lights, check your siren, uh, make sure that it has gas in it. Um, so some of this, the, the, the normal things, just to make sure that the ambulance is functional. Safety and miscellaneous equipment, you want to make sure you have your road flares or triangles in case of a breakdown. And then obviously you want to make sure you have your ALS equipment, your medications. Uh, routine detailed chip checks, minimize issues of risk management, uh, medications expire, you want to check the dates. Um, vehicle checks regularly, always in safe working order. Uh, so you do want to make sure those expiration dates are checked. Uh, I don't know um, how everyone does it in their particular organization. 
Uh, most medication dates are going to expire at the end of the month. Um, you're going to get a full month out of them. There are medications, though, that will expire a particular day of the month. Um, there are medications that will outdate if they're not refrigerated. So it's important to always look at your medications, make sure that they're in good working order. Um, we know as paramedics, it's our responsibility to make sure that all of our equipment is appropriate. If you give somebody a medication that's expired or you give somebody the wrong medication, uh, you're accountable because that's your job. Your job is to make sure that you're doing your job safely. And part of that is to make sure that your equipment, your medications are all appropriate. Make sure the ambulance is properly disinfected after transport. Again, a very popular topic right now. Um, what about if I were to ask um, properly disinfected? That's gonna mean a little something different to everybody. Uh, what would, uh, some, some thoughts here from the group, what would you say is properly disinfected? If I asked you, if, is your ambulance deconned? What would be your definition of the ambulance being deconned? So, at Bikes for EMS, obviously, our definition of being deconned is during COVID, maybe maybe a little bit different. Um, if we've given an aerosolized treatment, if we've CPAPed a patient, we are now um, spraying it down with an alcohol solution from top to bottom and everything gets wiped. Um, on a normal day, I think, as long as there's no uh, infectious fluids that have been spewing around, I don't think we typically do that. But we obviously want to make sure that we're wiping down everything that the patient has touched and everything that, that we have touched between most calls. Does is, is anyone else do anything differently? I do, we do the same thing where I'm at. Um, where we don't usually touch much of anything if there isn't anything grossly obvious. And obviously right now things are different. Um, but I mean, I think just for my personal, I just wipe at least the doorknobs and all the handlebars, but I don't do a, a gross decon at every shift. And I would likely say that, that that's probably the norm. The norm is to, uh, to go ahead and wipe those frequently touched surfaces, to wipe the surfaces that the patient may have touched those areas where your, your workspace, your generalized workspace, but you're probably not wiping down the cabinets and the, and the ceilings and, and so forth and so on on each and every call. Obviously a little bit different now um, with the high index of suspicion with COVID, um, but, but typically a routine uh, properly disinfected would be to make sure all those surfaces are clean, uh, make sure all those frequently touched areas are clean um, and just give it a, a, a good wash down. Uh, and, and don't forget the cab either. Uh, remember that's where you're functioning as well um, so you want to make sure that's wiped down uh, to make sure that everything is everything that's going to be touched is clean um, documenting clean and disinfecting on the shift checklist there should be something that that goes ahead and documents uh, that the vehicle was deconned uh, whether that just be a simple uh, shift report on the, as somebody had said the honor system uh, but possibly passing that along to the next uh, the next crew, your relief, letting them know that the vehicle was clean and disinfected, uh, whether that's logging it on some sort of electronic check, uh, checklist, uh, whether that's a paper checklist and just checking off that the, uh, the vehicle was clean and disinfected. Uh, we should be making sure that we're tracking that on a regular basis um, so that we make sure that that vehicle is getting clean. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is operate in a dirty environment. We certainly don't want to be bringing our patients into that environment. Make sure all your scheduled tests, maintenance, calibrations on medical equipment are completed. Um, one of the, the important parts about that statement there is make sure that the, uh, the person that's completing that maintenance and those calibrations is, uh, is the appropriate person to do that. Uh, some of this equipment uh, needs to be maintained um, by a professional. Uh, we, we certainly have some of the smaller agencies, uh, you know, maybe in rural areas that, that, that may not uh, have access to some of those specialized resources. Um, but you certainly can't be uh, can't be tinkering with a, a life pack and expecting that you know how to do some of those troubleshooting repairs uh, if you've never been trained. Uh, it's a you know it's a piece of important equipment, um, and we need to make sure that it's it's appropriately repaired. Um, so make sure that whoever's doing that maintenance, those calibrations, if you need a service contract, establish that. Uh, if you have somebody who's able to do that, make sure they're trained and appropriate to be able to do something like that. Because again, we need to make sure that equipment works when it needs to work. 
uh, just some medical equipment uh, that potentially uh, would would be on your truck, things that you would need to uh, to be mindful of. Uh, suction units, laryngoscope blades, lighted stylets, pen lights, other battery operated equipment. That's an important one. Uh, if you're uh, if you go ahead and you leave something on, um, you certainly when you go reach for it later, it's going to be dead as a door now. Uh, so make sure that you're checking your equipment. Make sure you uh, you you go ahead and you shut it off when you're done. Otherwise, when you go reaching for it uh, three, four, five hours later, uh, you may find it no longer works. Uh, even though you did due diligence in checking it, you leave it on. Obviously, the batteries are going to die. Ambulance deployment and staffing. So strategy used by an EMS agency to maneuver ambulances and crews to reduce response times, um, location of facilities to house ambulance, location of hospitals, anticipated volume of calls, specific geographic and traffic con considerations of the area. So all things when you're trying to consider, okay, what do I do as far as deployment goes? Where do I want those resources? Um, how close are they to the hospital? Where's my call volume going to be? Making sure you're putting the ambulances where the calls are. So here's here's an interesting scenario. Say you were you were placed in charge of, of an EMS service and the municipal leader said, you know what, you've got a clean slate. Um, how many ambulances do you think you need? Where would you put them? Think of this as an urban municipality. Um, what would you need to know and how would you make your decision? Uh, give me a couple of thoughts from the group. Say you were given Lancaster City uh, and Mayor Sirachi came and said, you're in charge now, I uh, give you you have a clean slate. Where would you put your ambulances and uh, and how many would you need and what information do you need to make those decisions? I would think your uh, population, you take the hospital distance into consideration, and then depending on where you have your uh, majority of calls, depending on your areas, that call more than off, uh, more often than others. Uh, okay, would population be, be the bigger be the bigger determination, or or would you want to would you want to focus that even down further? What you want to know is it a younger population, an older population? Uh, yeah, that'd be important. I think you'd want to take into account nursing homes, uh, specialized care facilities, schools, um, even maybe a homeless shelter, like places that are going to have a, a high volume regardless of maybe how many people are there. Okay. Any other thoughts? So all good thoughts, um, some, some great, great insight here. Uh, you certainly do want to know. You want to know um, where those high high volume areas are going to be. You want to know where the volume areas are going to be in the city. You want to know the population. What is the population like? Uh, is this somebody? Um, what are your What are your doctor's office like? Are there clinics? Are there urgent cares? Um, that certainly has an influence on things. What's the hospital volume like? Did they see a lot of patients? What type of patients? High acuity, low acuity. Um, what was the volume like at the service that handled EMS previously? Did they have any information there? Or did they know what their volume is? ALS, ALS, ALS. Um, These are all considerations that you would want to know about. Um, as you said uh, about the, uh, the, hospital, <coughs> the hospitals, that's also an important indicator. What's your turnaround time going to be? Uh, where's your volume at? Is it during the daytime hours? Is it at night? Is it 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 7 o'clock in the morning? Um, these are all important things to know. Where you put your ambulances, what type of ambulance, and what are the hours for those ambulances? So um, a lot of things that you have to consider uh, when you're trying to determine where you place those resources. Um, other considerations, past community responses. You know, what has the community become accustomed to? 
Um, you know, if they, they were accustomed to having, you know, six ambulances in a town that had 10,000 people, well, is, is that right? You know, they're, they're used to having six ambulances, but do they need six ambulances? Um, project, projected demographic changes. Uh, we all know that the baby boomers are starting to retire. We all know that there are a large um, segment of the population, and we know that their medical needs are going to increase. So what's the demographics like? Do we have a, a lot of population in their 60s that are going to start drifting into this retirement age where our, our index of those, those assisted living facilities or those retirement communities, um, they're going to start seeing uh, higher, higher, um, higher volume. Uh, so we wanna consider that. And then the highest volume, um, the peak load described in terms of day, day of week and time of day. Which days and times are you seeing this? Some other things to consider. Uh, is whether or not the communities are open to that change. Uh, as I said, maybe they had five or six ambulances. Maybe for, for years they were all ALS, but you realize that they don't need all ALS, they need some BLS resources. Are they open to that? Uh, if you've had an ambulance parked down the street for the last 20 years, uh, would you be open to having that ambulance moved um, 10 blocks away because the volume in another area is much higher than where the volume is for you? Um, some communities may push back on that. Um, how, how does the community generally react when a fire station closes? I can tell you that they, they react in Philadelphia the same way they reacted in Lancaster City when they talked about closing a fire station. Uh, the public comes out in droves to say, no, I've had this firehouse here for, for ages. I, I want that fire truck down the street from my, my house. How about the, um, the big community outpouring when UPMC Lancaster closed? Uh, there was a huge outpouring. There are community groups that still talk about that. Um, so. You know, that's certainly something that you have to be mindful of when you're thinking about deployment staffing, that just because the numbers mean one thing, the community may think something different, and there's gonna be some, some things that you're gonna to have to incorporate there when you're trying to determine where you're going to deploy and how you're going to staff. Uh, so different types of deployment, um, you know, your, your primary area, which your front first, first two district, uh, you deploy ambulances, wait for calls of specific high volume times, uh, number of ambulances available and expected call volume. So you could have peak units, units that are just in for that high volume time. Um, the number of ambulances expected, the number of, uh, uh, or number of ambulances available and expected call volume. You certainly don't wanna have six ambulances and only two calls per hour. Uh, that's certainly not going to balance itself. You wanna make sure that you have the appropriate ambulances during that appropriate peak time of the day uh, and for the appropriate volume. So you don't want too few ambulances, you don't want too many, you have to find that sweet spot. System status management. So system status management is designed to meet the service demands with fewer resources. It's that sweet spot. It's finding that, that balance between making sure that you have the appropriate number of ambulances to meet the volume, um, to make sure that you don't have ambulances just, just sitting and not turning calls, uh, but also not so many that the, uh, that the staff members running those ambulances are burning out. So you have to find that sweet spot um, as far as the system status goes. Um, better allocated resources on temporal and geospatial data. So the temporal data, making sure that those, those ambulances are, um, are going to be, be there at the volume and the time of day that's needed. Uh, so all, a lot of that can be, can be drawn out of the technology that's available predicting that, that volume and location you can see where that volume of calls are. Is it at 10 o'clock in the morning through six o'clock in the evening? Um, and you can see you know, what day of the week it is. So you can start determining um, when are my calls? And then you can determine uh, where those calls are. Uh, do we see them in a particular area? As I, I think Brandon may have noted, you know, is there a nursing home or a shelter uh, that you might see every morning the shelter opens up and kicks everybody out at eight o'clock by 8 30 you have three four trucks there every hour picking people up okay that's something you need to know you might want to position a truck someplace in that pocket around that time that peak hour unit um, so system status management allows you to do that allows you to move trucks and appropriate trucks so that your system balances out to the volume and the needs and a lot of technologies first watch is a perfect example of a, a techno technological option that allows you to go and find out where those calls are, plot those calls, and be able to base your system and your resources around uh, having the right, right personnel, the right resources at the right time of day. So response time can make a difference. 
um, I th think that's a, a strong note there between life and death. Uh, so we, we do know that getting, uh, getting CPR and AED there in a short span of time can make a difference. Uh, four minutes uh, shows that improved outcomes. If you can get that CPR and that AED there within that first four minutes, it's going to have improved outcomes. Uh, we also know that uh, appropriate response times, um, they're, they're kind of driven by community and available resources, something that we talked about a little bit already. Um, the community is going to have in their mind what they what they consider to be that that metric. When should that ambulance get there? Well, most people think it should get there 30 seconds after dispatch. Um, so the community has their own idea on how quickly that ambulance should get there. Um, but we do know that um, you know getting that AED and that that CPR there as quickly as possible matters within that first four minutes has a high um, probability of success in cardiac arrest. Um, we know that getting that ALS unit there that second tier within that eight minutes and 59 seconds. Uh, also is ideal as far as getting that window there to be able to get those advanced interventions on board. Um, so that's just some statistical data. Um, but, you know, when you start looking, at, you see the header up there, that traffic congestion, um, it's going to matter. And that's where system status management comes in. Um, we do know that if our volume is in a certain particular area, or we know that um, rush hour is between seven and nine every morning, uh, we want to make sure that we might want to reposition some ambulances during that pocket of time so that they have an opportunity getting to some, some of those high volume areas a little quicker, knowing that you have some of that traffic congestion. Operational staffing, so they should take into account peak load of the system. Some services vary shift times to ensure coverage for busiest days of the week and busiest times of the day. So you're going to have that where you're going to have to take into account the peak load of the system. Uh, you don't want all of your providers to all be shift changing all at the same time and not have some offset units. Um, so if everyone's always shift changing at the same time, uh, you're always going to have that log jam. Um, if you all your, your resources go in service all at the same time, you're not going to have that volume that you need, that, that those apparatus and those personnel that you need when you need them. Um, so you want to make sure that you kind of stagger them and that the staggering meets where your volume is. And again, there's different ways of doing that, a first watch or just doing some basic analysis on your own uh, to draw out your calls. Where are they? What time of day? A lot of that can be driven through your PCR programs. Uh, do a little legwork, pull that out into an Excel sheet. You can see where's my volume at. Take a couple of months, compare them together. Learn where your volume is, what time your volume is, and start plotting that down and see which areas that volume is. And you can ensure that you have the appropriate start times for your resources and in the appropriate areas. Uh, take into account the need for uh, reserve capacity. Um, that's something that I know most services have done here with the COVID pandemic is look at what happens if I should start to see staffing shortages? What would happen if our volume suddenly started to increase uh, where it's taking longer to do turnaround of calls where, uh, where, where our providers are running call to call to call? Um, what do we do for that reserve capacity? Um, you need to go ahead and have those plans in place, um, whether it be callbacks, call back the offgoing shift to come back in, whether that be mandatory overtime, paging systems for open shifts, um, incentives to bring people in on overtime, uh, whatever it may be, you should always have that reserve capacity uh, kind of thought process or have that filled out pre plan just in the event that you need it. We never know when we're going to have those large scale incidents where we're going to need to bring additional staff on in a short span of time. So we always want to be prepared for that. Each service needs to determine standards for operators, drivers, and for vehicles, for driving the vehicle itself. I think that's very important. You need to have your criteria. Obviously, the state has its criteria to make sure that the driver is licensed, to make sure that the driver has their EVOC and EMSVO. Uh, you want to make sure you have your own standards. And so apart from that, it very well may be those basic standards. It may be something a little bit more. Um, but you should have whatever your driving standards are and make sure that everybody's held accountable. So talking about ambulance operations, making sure that everyone's safe, uh, proactive collision prevention program, recognition and definition of a problem, marked increase in frequency of ground ambulance accidents over the past decade, and modern automobiles better sealed and more soundproof. Uh, so what does it mean when we talk about proactive collision prevention program? I'm sure that's different for everyone. I'm going to go to the group again. Um, what does that initial driver education and continued driver education look like in each of our different agencies?
Rick, is this normally a very talkative group? They're usually in class. I can't get them to shut up. But online, because we can mute them all, they, uh, um, you know, they tend to, um, you know, keep to themselves. But, you know, we got some chatting going on there. So, um, you know, guys, we're trying to figure out, like I said, Jerry had said, you know, well, there's the national standards that go along. You know, we all work within um, parameters provided by that. And we're just trying to get an idea to see how different as well as how much, um, the same that everybody is. So uh, please offer your um, opinions. Can you just repeat the question one more time, please? Sure. Um, so how, how does your service uh, handle initial driver education and continuing education? Um, so at least with my experience, um, the mandatory minimum is that you have to come into the job with EVOC, um, I don't think I've ever seen a place pay for an initial one. Um, usually you get that obviously in your schooling and then just to keep it up, we we bring in um, people from Bucks County Community College who do their public safety stuff to do the in-house EVOC for the entire department. Um, so you, that's usually staggered, but um, the company pays for the, I guess the re-enlisting of that certification just to keep it all um, kosher. And how often do you redo the EVOC? Uh, it's to mine. I mean, I think it's following the uh, the EMT certs now. So we're doing it every um, like year and a half to two years, depending on when people are staggered. Um, this one, I think the average is. Okay. Is that a full class or just a remediated driving cone course? It's it's remediate. I don't even think, that, to be completely honest, I don't think we even do the physical driving aspect of it because it's assumed that everybody's driving from work but there's the remediate um, when it comes to new driving laws or anything like new studies that have come out about driving emergency vehicle sure um how about initial driver education so if you hire a new staff member they come on they have evoc they have emsvo uh do you just go ahead and tell them hey get behind my hundred and seventy thousand dollar ambulance turn the wheel hit the lights and go for it or is there initial driver education that's needed no i mean essentially yeah to answer, to answer your first question yes quite second question no i mean if somebody comes on with the certification it's implied that they know what they're doing so there's a an initial onboarding of location and geographics of where you're at but it's assumed that the certification has cleared them enough to drive the ambulance at least in my experience where there is no initial like onboarding, you have to do this much driving and this amount of time, or these are the obstacles you have to do. It's just assume that you have it. Okay. And I'm sure this certainly is something that changes um, from location to location, agency to agency. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of younger uh, individuals getting into EMS, uh, and for some, uh, they very well may drive a, a very small uh, Prius, and then the uh, the next thing you know, they're in a, a Type One ambulance that's uh, you know rolling down the road at the emergency rate. So um, be mindful that a lot of times, uh, while there are some EVOC courses that will take you on the road for some of their training, uh, most are done on a cone course. So they uh, the operator may have gained their EVOC just driving that ambulance on a cone course. Which, if I'm unless I'm mistaken, EVOC does not even require that it be an ambulance that you use through the course. Uh, that you just complete the EVOC course. So they very well may not, not have driven your type one ambulance um, before. It may be the first time they've been behind the wheel of one of those vehicles and the first time they've been on the road with it. Um, so it's certainly something that we wanna make sure that if we don't do that initial driver training, at least when we're doing our onboarding, if we have our, our training officers, we wanna make sure that they're doing a really good job with uh, going over and making sure that that person understands and knows the rules of the road, can handle the vehicle, knows how the vehicle operates, um, differences in braking distances. Um, so there's a lot involved in driving a 12,000 pound vehicle uh, than it is driving a Honda Prius. So, um, you know, certainly certainly a lot of differences and that initial education, that continued education could be port important, very important, um, you know, when it, when it starts talking about vehicle accidents. And when we look at the frequency of ground ambulance accidents, uh, there's been 4,500 ambulance accidents reported between 1992 and 2011. Um, now bear in mind that these are reported and uh, from all the information I was able to extrapolate, it seems that uh, there's certainly some that don't get reported. Uh, they pull everything through police accident reports and some of those low acuity 
accidents aren't necessarily gone through via police report. Uh, maybe you bump a bumper here, you take a mirror off there, they're all unreported accidents. It's just those accidents that vehicles are going to need to be towed or there's an injury that are generally submitted via police report. So I suspected that 4,500 ambulance accidents is probably good, a good bit higher than that. Um, they're just the ones that are significant. Um, one other point, when modern automobiles are better sealed and more soundproof, I think that everyone can appreciate that. Uh, I know that when I'm in my car with the windows up and the radio on, it's gonna take quite a bit before uh, that ambulance coming up behind me. If I don't see them in my, my mirror before I hear those sirens, they're gonna get pretty close because I can certainly jam to some Metallica um, when I have a chance. So, you know, just, uh, just be mindful that there's a lot of distractions. The vehicles are more soundproof. Um, we have the radios going, uh, we have our phones, uh, we have uh, people who are texting, um, eating, drinking, uh, all those things contribute to a distracted driver who's just not paying attention to that ambulance coming up behind them. Uh, something I had mentioned earlier, uh, ambulances do have increase in size and weight. It's not a Honda Prius. Uh, it's a 12,000 pound vehicle, if not more than. Um, they accelerate poorly, less responsive, have much greater braking distance. Um, it's a lot of weight to try and stop in a short span of time. Um, you have to be mindful of that. The center of gravity is certainly different than automobiles. You know, when you're coming around a, a corner, you're going to pitch and rock, especially if you're, if you're catching a bump as you come around that curve. So a lot of different differences between driving a vehicle and driving an ambulance. Most collisions take place on clear days. Uh, we would certainly think that uh, on a nasty nasty weather day that you're gonna have more vehicle accidents. But I think uh, if we go ahead and all appreciate the fact that are you more prone to take your time and drive safe in nasty weather conditions or on a nice clear sunny day? Now the answer is gonna be that nice clear sunny day, you take a little bit more liberty than you would on other, other times. Uh, ambulance accidents are most prevalent at intersections with a stoplight and a high percentage of those are while driving lights and sirens. Again, I don't think this is anything shocking here. Um, where are we going to have the most contact with, a, with another vehicle? It's going to be at an intersection. Uh, it's going to be at a stoplight. And it's going to be when we're driving lights and sirens because otherwise we're stopping at that red light. So these are, are obviously going to be where most of those accidents are going to occur. Denver Ambulance, uh, they had a study that was done um, between 1989 and 1997, 75% of their responses were via lights and sirens and 91% Okay, it was accounted for 91% of those crashes. So out of all of their crashes, 91% occurred um, with those lights and sirens. So just give you an idea on, uh, on how that lights and sirens influences. And again, it's going to be at those intersections. It's going to be that time where you're not clearing that intersection, you're going through and you're going to meet that other vehicle. And they generally have some pretty nasty uh, results. Collisions prevented by determining when, where, and, uh, and they're, they're likely to occur. Um, I think we've already kind of beaten that horse a good bit. It's gonna be at intersections. Routine use of driver qualification checklists and driver's license checks. Making sure that that driver that you have behind the wheel doesn't have um, four speeding tickets and six points on their driver's license. Um, demonstrate driver understanding of preventive, preventive ma ma mechanical maintenance. You certainly don't want to go and uh, flooring the accelerator and slamming the brakes every every light to light. Uh, that's going to have your ambulance off the road pretty quickly and the mechanic a little bit uh, upset that he's replacing brakes every so many thousand miles. Provision of adequate hands-on driver training using experienced and qualified field training officers. I think we spoke a little bit about that, making sure that uh, the staff member you have behind the wheel knows the rules of the road. Uh, make sure that they, uh, they're certainly comfortable in driving that ambulance. They know the difference of that ambulance. They're, uh, they, they're, they're, they're certainly not driving a, a small little Prius or a, a small vehicle. They're driving a very heavy uh, ambulance. Slow speed course to ensure operators that they can use their mirrors back up, park, handle the ambulance. Uh, the one gentleman who, who said that they do EVOC every year, year and a half, I think that's phenomenal to be able to do that, to get everyone through those cone courses and just kind of focus going back to the basics and focus on, uh, on doing some of those maneuvers through the cones. Um, what better way than to have uh, some sort of an isolated course where you can do that and everyone can just go through those motions and just focus. Um, very frequently do we do that. Training insurance operators know how to react to emergency situations. Um, you know, making sure that the, uh, the provider knows the motor vehicle code, 
knows what they're meant to do and when they're meant to do it. Um, primary and, and backup routes to all hospitals. If something's blocked, they know how to get there. They don't turn down the street that they shouldn't. I know for those who uh, who tend to get into Lancaster City, there are a number of, street, number of streets that uh, we tell all of our staff members, don't go down these streets because your ambulance won't fit. We've had a number of people bang mirrors and scratch cars that we know that ambulances don't fit down these streets. So make sure you plan your route of travel and you have a backup route so you don't use these streets. So the driver needs to know that. What could your vehicle safely navigate? Understand the rules, regulations, and laws the Department of Motor Vehicle has established. I think this is very important when you start looking at the differences between ambulances, um, fire department vehicles, and police department vehicles under the PA Motor Vehicle Code. There's differences there. And uh, if you if you uh, are a volunteer firefighter, uh, you certainly have some liberties when you're behind the wheel uh, compared to when you're behind the wheel of that ambulance. And knowing the difference is very important. Procedure for qualifying as an ambulance operator. Well, the state took care of a good portion of that in Pennsylvania requiring EVOC and EMSBO and your driver's license, handling and reporting an ambulance collision. I think that uh, in most cases, um, everyone's going to have the same prop, uh, procedure and that's going to be notify uh, the 911, get the police out there, uh, do your, your exchange, notify your supervisor. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty apparent that most of those ambulance accidents should be handled much the same as you would in your own vehicle if you were involved in an accident. Investigating and reviewing each collision. Uh, if your service is not doing this, it's highly encouraged. You certainly want to make sure that you're looking at every accident to determine what went wrong in this situation. Is there something that we can do better uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen again? Accidents are going to happen. If, if they weren't uh, an, an accident, they would be called on purposes, but they're not. Um, nobody wants to have an accident, but when it does happen, the idea is to go ahead and put in the processes to make sure it doesn't happen again. And whether that's education of the staff member, whether that's going to be uh, engineering changes, whatever it may be, it's important that you go through and investigate, determine what caused the accident, put in the processes to prevent it from happening again. And make sure that there's that quality assurance. Uh, you certainly don't want to go ahead and continue to repeat the same process over and over and over again. If something's not right, then fix it. Always make sure you have a spotter when backing up your vehicle. Uh, use seatbelts in the ambulance. Um, make sure you understand how, what the differences are when you're transporting a pediatric and guidelines on what constitutes an emergency response. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there's numerous protocols that outline how you're meant to operate an emergency vehicle and how you're meant to uh, secure pediatrics in your ambulance. Uh, if you haven't looked at those protocols in a while, I highly encourage that you review them. Um, they, uh, they outline things pretty, pretty tightly. Uh, and certainly something that's that's very important uh, and so, something that I would imagine most EMS providers are guilty of. It's not making sure you're using your seatbelts in the back of the ambulance. Uh, know that ambulance attendants in the back are 2.7 times more likely to be injured in a vehicle accident uh, than, than uh, anybody in the front of cab. Why? Because you're forward facing, seatbelted, and the person in the back is getting tossed around. Lancaster EMS has drive cameras in all the vehicles. We've had a couple of heartbreaking incidents. We've had some minor vehicle accidents. And when that camera triggers and that person in the back um, uh, is not seatbelted, you watch that person and you watch what happens. And we've had some people who've been injured because they weren't belted, the brakes were hit pretty hard, and that person staggered or fell um, because they weren't belted in. So make sure you're wearing your seatbelts in the ambulance. It could certainly mean the difference uh, in an injury or fatality. Um, using your spotter, make sure you're properly placed. You can see in this photo here that the person is properly placed. They're in the back, uh, back corner of the vehicle. The driver can see them in their mirror. They're using good hand signals. The driver understands what the, uh, the, the spotter is meant to tell them. Um, you can't see everything in an ambulance. You have, even if the, with a backup camera, you're going to have blind spots. Whenever you have a spotter, use a spotter. It's best practice and it's gonna make sure that everyone stays safe. Prudent speed, proper travel, uh, circumstances for using oncoming lanes, safe negotiated intersections, uh, zero tolerance for driving vehicles under the influence of alcohol or drugs. I think that second part kind of goes without saying. Um, you should never have anybody on your vehicle that's going to be driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, and the guidelines on prudent speed, proper travel, circumstances for using oncoming lanes. Uh, this is all outlined in the PA Motor Vehicle Code. Uh, if you have not looked at that, I would encourage that you do. 
Um, know that EMS is governed the same as a blood delivery vehicle or organ donation vehicle. Uh, you do not have the same liberties as police and fire. You are required to stop at every intersection. You are required to operate within the speed limit. Uh, you're not extended those same liberties. So it's important that you understand what that motor vehicle code is and you follow it to a T because if you're involved in an incident, you will be held accountable. So do regard exempts ambulances from certain laws, but at the same time holds them to a higher standard. I think that's spot on, held to a higher standard. Even though that you do have that due regard, you come to that complete stop at that intersection. You go ahead and make sure that all of the other drivers give you that right of way to be able to move through that intersection. Um, if something happens and you are involved in a vehicle accident, you will still be held accountable. Um, so that's very important. You're driving a vehicle, a big billboard, a big large vehicle, you're taking some liberties. Um, you have to make sure that you hold yourself to that higher standard because the law will. So this real, really is, uh, it, the, the state laws exempt ambulance drivers operating emergency from posted speed limits, posted directions to travel, parking regulations and requirements to rate at, wait at red lights. Um, some of this is very broad based because um, we should not just focus on what happens in, in Pennsylvania, but we should be very broad in our focus here. Um, but if we're looking at Pennsylvania, as I'd already mentioned, some of those things are a little bit different. Um, but you should always look at the motor vehicle code for the state that you're in and any other type of regulations um, such as uh, protocol or, uh, or state EMS regulations that would govern how you're to operate that emergency vehicle. So there are liberties extended to emergency vehicles, but you need to understand what they are in your particular area. So this is interesting that ambulances are rarely or never exempted from passing railroad crossing with gates down. Uh, I would highly encourage no one to ever do that. Um, school bus with flashing red lights. So up until recently, um, this honestly was, uh, was something that was just kind of a, a, a staple. You never pass a school bus with flashing red lights. However, uh, in the Motor Vehicle Code under PA Title 75-3105, the driver of an emergency vehicle uh, shall come to a complete stop when a school bus flashes its red lights and activates its side stop signal arms. After stopping, the driver of the emergency vehicle may pass the school bus only after exercising due diligence and caution for the safety of the students in a manner that, not, that will not risk the safety of the students. So that's very important. It, does, it says you can pass that school bus, but only after you've been able to exercise due diligence and caution for the safety of the students. That's very broad based, um, what determines that? I'd encourage that even though that, that, um, that buffer is in there to afford it, I would encourage that everyone uh, really be, uh, be judicious in when you're going to go ahead and pass a school bus with flashing red lights. In many cases, the driver is going to go ahead and give you some uh, some indicator that it's safe to go ahead and do something like that, um, but you certainly want to be mindful that um, we, we don't want to injure somebody else to, on, our, on our way to go ahead and help somebody. So please be mindful that even though that statute exists and allows you to pass that school bus, um, please be very, very cautious when you do. Um, I think this was already kind of covered. Um, you're always held to a higher standard. You must be attentive and prepared to shoulder the responsibility that come with profession you've chosen. There have been ambulance attendants who have caused motor vehicle accidents and have been held liable by the letter of the law. Um, they have been arrested and charged with manslaughter and they are serving prison time. Be mindful when you get behind the vehicle of that ambulance and you take those liberties, you are responsible and held to that higher standard. Um, make sure you don't rely on the, uh, the lights and sirens. Um, motorists less inclined to yield to ambulances when the sirens sound continuously, and many feel that the right-of-way privileges are abused when sirens are sounded. Um, know that the Department of Health, the uh, Department of Transportation, I'm sorry, sponsored a study way back in the 1970s, concluded that sirens were effective when vehicles were traveling in the same direction of the emergency vehicle, vehicles were weaving slowly through dense stationary traffic, or for pedestrians. They were the times when sirens were most effective. Other times, not so much. You're driving through the city and you're blasting that siren. You're coming through in and out of, of, of tight intersections with buildings um, bordering those intersections. It may be a last minute before that other driver hears you coming. 
So you want to be mindful that those sirens, even though they're playing and you can hear them, it doesn't mean that everybody else does. <clears throat> it was also found that alternating the wail and the yelp uh, and, uh, and incorporating rumblers um, are ways to being able to, uh, to kind of get over some of those sound barriers and, uh, and keep that monotony of that siren so people know when you're approaching those intersections or when you're getting closer. They also found that the, uh, the air horn was the least effective way of being able to, uh, to kind of let people know you're coming. So um, be mindful, uh, you know, pay attention to the studies, pay attention to the data. Um, don't rely on just saying I have my lights and sirens on that people are going to yield to me. I do know that there's there's a number of, uh, of, of providers out there who, uh, who who feel that you know um, you know the the motorists must yield to them and they get very irritated when they don't. Uh, be mindful that they might not see you, they might not hear you. So just uh, just be open minded with that. Uh, experienced motor motors inexperienced motorists tend to increase driving by 10 to 15 miles an hour when the siren is sounded. That's a bit of a panic. They see you coming. They're trying to speed to get out of your way. Um, Continue to sound the siren. Can, possibly worsen the condition of sick or injured patients by increasing their anxiety. If you have somebody in the back and that siren's going, uh, they may get worked up. I mean, that's, you know, they, there's, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of things going on. So that might have an impact on them as well. So you wanna be mindful of that. Uh, ambulance operators may develop anxiety and hearing problems from sirens used on long runs. Use siren sparingly only when, only when you must and never assume motorists will hear the siren. Uh, another thing that I remember learning when I first got on the uh, on the job as an EMT was the uh, white knuckle, knuckle syndrome. Uh, it's when an EMS provider gets behind the wheel as soon as they turn that lights and sirens on. The hands grip the wheel so hard that their, their knuckles turn white. Their anxiety goes high, their aggressiveness uh, increases, um, and that's certainly a recipe for disaster. So you want to be in control. You want to drive appropriately, not aggressive. You want to be defensive when you're driving, uh, and you want to um, be always mindful about what the other other motorists are going to do. Uh, be prepared for panic and erratic maneuvers when drivers do not hear your siren. Um, don't use the siren to scare anyone. Um, know that uh, that folks are, are going to go ahead and they're going to panic. They're going to do things different. They may all of a sudden hit the brakes out of nowhere when they see you. They may pull to the right instead of the left. May hit the gas. You just never know. So always be prepared. <clears throat> So having your headlights on to increase your visibility is always a good idea. Uh, with your lights, each corner of the ambulance should have uh, large flashers, blink in tandem or unison, helps, uh, helps oncoming vehicles identify location and size. One thing to be mindful of is that ambulances now, uh, the intensity and the style of the light bulbs have gotten better and better. Um, <clears throat> whether that's better and better or worse and worse is certainly controversial. So it, it's certainly much brighter, but it's going to influence the other, uh, the other motorists on the road. So requesting right of way, some of the uh, some of the recommendations, <clears throat> flashing white lights or auto flashing headlights on the front of your vehicle, so people can see it. Flashing red lights on all top corners of the ambulance, flashing in synchronous patterns, and flashing lights on forward corners of the front fender. Um, they outline the, the front of the vehicle, and that's some of the better ways of being able to identify the vehicle as it's coming. Uh, you want to make sure you're visible clearly from 360 degrees to motors and pedestrians. Uh, must ensure benefits afforded by lights and sirens are not offset by risk to crew and the public. So you're driving lights and sirens, you wanna make sure that you're not gonna put yourself in, in a bad situation uh, and have another motorist hit you because you're in that, in that lights and sirens pattern. So just make sure that the, there's gonna be benefit. Another thing to remember too is that um, these, these bright lights and these high intensity lights uh, they're going to blind the other driver. So when you're on a vehicle crash and these lights are on, the other driver very well may not see you. And maybe not so much even a vehicle accident. Suppose you're, you're rolling a stretcher um, to, the, to the ambulance and you've got these lights on. Be mindful that the other driver may not see you. It creates a, a, an uncomfortable glare from the brightness of these lights. And they may not see your silhouette. Uh, so just be very careful with some of these lights. Um, they're, they're intended to be more visible, high intensity but they certainly have their downsides too. So make sure again uh, that there's benefit there. You might wanna go ahead and scale that down. Um, <clears throat> you want, might wanna use something that's going to be a little less um, bright with those lights, maybe take off 
uh, shut some of those lights down, maybe use your blinkers or something thereof, uh, just to go ahead and just make that a little bit safer because the bright intensity might go ahead and make it unsafe for you. Most agencies no longer suggest the use of police escort for ambulances. <clears throat> Ambulance police cars at different braking distances and different acceleration speeds. So the idea of the police car racing ahead and blocking an intersection uh, is certainly not something that we do routinely. Uh, it has its own uh, pitfalls. <clears throat> They're not likely to realize that two emergency vehicles are coming together. Uh, potential for intersection collisions and um, certainly negotiated intersections, assuming you may need another emergency vehicle. I think that's a big one. Uh, if you're uh, driving down the road, uh, and many times if it's a high acuity event, <clears throat> you might have police, fire, and EMS all dispatched to that particular incident. You need to know where the other vehicles are coming from. It's uh, <clears throat> something that may happen where you may come to an intersection at the same time as that fire truck does. So just be mindful that the public's going to be reacting to those lights and sirens. So if you're coming from two different directions, that can certainly be a problem as well as you come from two different directions, you can wind up impacting each other. So you want to be, uh, be mindful of that. <clears throat> Scene size ups for potential hazards. We talked to one of, one, about one of those, and that being those bright, intense lights, <clears throat> making sure that other people can see you, wearing that reflective vest, that ANSI reflective vest, that's certainly going to be important. Uh, establishing the danger zone, park at least 100 feet away from wreckage, upwind and uphill to avoid fire, or escape hazardous liquids. Um, that's proper placement. Making sure your vehicle's placed appropriately. No fire escaping fluids, park at least 50 feet from the wreckage. Assign a member of the fire department to handle traffic until police arrive to take control of the task. Park in front of the wreckage. So warning lights can alert approaching motorists. <clears throat> Put up your flares um, or your triangles. Make sure that the uh, the incident's identified. If the scene's already secured, park behind the wreckage to prevent the ambulance from being exposed to traffic. Uh, so if it's already secured, you want to drive past it, pull over. Always be be aware of traffic hazards at the scene. <clears throat> so just some ideas on how you would park. Again, if the scene's already secure, you would park past the uh, the incident. Um, here's, a, here's another example. You would park here if the incident is not secure, just so people would see the emergency lights. And here's obviously the flares or your cones. Uh, so go ahead and denote that area to be blocked off. You can see the person here setting up some cones. Try to dispose the crew of the patient to traffic. Uh, the rear doors, when they're open, uh, they obstruct warning lights. So be mindful that uh, you know when you open those doors, that's going to have an impact as well. <clears throat> The red revolving lights may attract drunk or tired drivers. Pull off the road, turn off those lights, use just your amber blinkers um, to flash in tandem, or an alternating light pattern that identifies the ambulance that doesn't blind or overwhelm the other drivers. <clears throat> so one thing I've, I've started taking this uh, this course, this Tim's course, it's available through, uh, through the PA train. A uh, really good course, it does go ahead and highlight some of these things in a bit more detail to let you know some of the impact of parking in a certain area or, or blocking traffic in another way. Uh, it has some really good um, video footage uh, to really go ahead and highlight some of that. It shows you why you do what you do because it has some good drive cam footage. Um, so if you get the chance, it's a long course, but it's certainly very, uh, very beneficial and informative. Make sure you stop at all those red lights and stop signs. Proceed with caution. Always proceed through the intersection slowly. Make eye contact with motorists to ensure they understand your intentions. Make sure you're always observant for that person who may decide they're going to go around traffic and through the light. That happens. People become impatient. They don't understand why the traffic is stopped. Some, somebody might decide, hey, I'm going to go around these cars. And when they do, you're not looking for that person. You think that the traffic is stopped and here comes a motorist. So always be mindful when you're going through that intersection, go slow, be prepared to hit the brakes, be prepared for that outlier who's going to go around that traffic. <clears throat> Make sure you warn motorists by flashing those lights and sounding that siren, let them know. Um, remember, you're only asking the public to yield your right of way, it's not demanded, you don't have that. Uh, so always be mindful of that. Never assume that they know what you're planning on doing in an intersection. Maybe you're going to go in the intersection and make a left. Well, they don't know you're going through the intersection and turning left. Make sure you have your blinker on. Make sure you're taking your time and slowly going through that turn. Make sure they understand it. 
um, because they just see those lights and sirens. They have no idea which direction you're going or what you're doing. Uh, as I said, always watch, um, you know, to make sure that anybody who's going to come out, uh, that they're, uh, you know, you're, you're watching for that outlier. The car stopped at the intersection on the, uh, make sure you go around them on the driver's side, try not to pass them on that passenger side. The drivers are always supposed to pull to the right. Um, if motorists are doing what they should, they, then they may pull into the right lane just as you pass. So again, they should be on the left side, um, but not all, or they should pull to the right side, you should be able to pass on the left side. Know how long it takes to get through the intersection. So when you're going through, make sure you understand the, uh, the, the, the vehicle controls, how your vehicle operates, stopping, braking distance, acceleration, all the things we talked about earlier. Uh, watch pedestrians at the intersection. Make sure that nobody's going to walk out in front of you. Watch out for those in, impatient drivers. Uh, and no such thing as rolling stops in an ambulance weighing more than 10,000 pounds. I can tell you, letter of the law, talking with attorneys, you will not win that argument. If you don't bring that vehicle to a complete stop, you are wrong every single time. Every single time, you will be found liable. You have to bring that vehicle to a complete stop. It's letter of the law. A rolling stop is failure on your part. You will be hold, held liable. Okay, I can't say that enough. Okay, so just wrapping up some things we learned. Um, we learned about ambulance operations, uh, everyday experience, good habits, grow stronger with review and practice. The more often that you're going and learning those things, the more often that you're practicing, the more often that you're going through and doing your vehicle check, making sure you have your equipment, making sure that you know the, the rules of the road, you're practicing good habits, you're coming to a stop at the intersection. All those things continue to grow stronger the more you do them. Be familiar with your standards that influence your ambulance design, equipment requirements, and staffing. Um, the K specs, the NFPA, the CAS requirements for ambulance designs, that's not uh, interesting reading, but it's good. It's good to know why the ambulances are designed the way they are, um, why the things have changed, why they put slider seats in, why there's forward facing seats, why they want you buckled in. So all that is important, why they have the lights the way they do. So um, take advantage and learn why, ask people. Um, talk to the people who spec out your ambulances. Talk to builders. Talk about talk to some of these vendors, these uh, these these sales folks. They'll, they're more than happy to go ahead and pass along that knowledge to you. Complete all those checklists, whether whether they apply to vehicle onboard equipment or essential supplies. Checklists are there for a reason. We want to make sure that we have all the equipment that we need. We want to make sure that everything's serviceable and working. Um, if it isn't, then you want to catch it early. You don't want to be that person who shows up on a scene and realizes that the batteries in your monitor are dead or that your oxygen was draining the whole time or that you left your laryngoscope on. You want to make sure your equipment is ready to go when you get there. Go through that checklist. Do the things you're meant to do. Be aware that routine maintenance or calibration, exp expiration on drugs. Uh, you want to make sure all the, th that those things are checkboxed to make sure that the maintenance and calibration is done by somebody authorized to do it. Keep in mind OSHA requirements pr promote safety and personnel and patients. I had provided that OSHA um, uh, document. Take a chance, go through it. Uh, it is pretty lengthy, uh, but it gives you an idea on how OSHA has shaped some of the things that we do in the ambulance uh, and certainly some of the reasons why we decon or why the safety equipment we use is on those ambulances. Know how to report equipment problems or failures to your supervisor. When something happens, you obviously want to make your frontline supervisor aware. Um, they're going to be able to do an analysis and investigation, determine what the cause of the problem was and be able to correct that problem and then prevent that problem from happening in the future. You have a special responsibility every time you take the wheel. Um, remember that. Remember it's your duty to recognize uh, typical ambulance uh, and recognize um, the, uh, the typical ambulance collisions and develop strategies for preventing it. Uh, when you get behind this, the wheel of this ambulance, you have a tremendous responsibility as well as you'll be held liable if you do anything that's going to be in contrast to that or not according to the letter of the law. Letter of the law being the motor vehicle code. Uh, you wanna always analyze these collisions and learn. Learn from your coworkers who've been involved. Learn from the stories that are told. Learn from the statistics that are available. The National Highway Traffic Safety, they have a number of different documents on their website that you'll be able to utilize to be able to learn more about it. Go through, do the research, Talk with colleagues, talk with your supervisors, learn more about this because you have the ability of making sure that you're safe, your provider, your partner is safe and your patient's safe. 
Be aware of the issues surrounding staging and staffing of ambulances. Determine your agency's policies on these matters. You want to know where these ambulances should be placed. You want to know what the appropriate staffing levels are and what your policies are. <clears throat> so you want to you want to understand why things are the way they are. Uh, never become complacent. Just do things just because that's the way they've always been or that's the way you're told. Understand the whys, learn the whys, um, and just make sure make some good decisions as you're out and about. I hope that information was helpful for you. Uh, I hope you were able to learn something from it. Um, and, uh, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer.